Okay. Hi, let me welcome everybody here today. I am Jim Lindsay. I am the director of the uh, Robert S. Strauss Center for International Security and Law. The Strauss Center was founded in recognition of the fact that globalization is remaking the world as we know it. It's creating immense prosperity uh, and stimulating economic growth. But as we saw on September 11, 2001, it's also spawning new dangers and vulnerabilities. We see these problems in our daily newspapers, nuclear terrorism, proliferation, climate change, uh, spread of infectious diseases and killer epidemics. Uh, even more recently, concerns about a excessively integrated international architecture uh, that will spawn global panics. So it makes uh, sense for the Strauss Center to have its own uh, globalization speaker series. And as we were putting together the globalization speaker series, one of the things that we immediately recognized is that globalization is not something new. And that if we were really going to contribute to the discussion of globalization on campus, it would be useful to make sure we integrate a historical perspective. Because regardless of whether uh, you buy into uh, Tom Freeman's Globalization 1.0, 2.0, 3.0 or not, the reality is societies have been growing increasingly interconnected uh, for quite some time. Now, I must say we were absolutely delighted uh, to have the inaugural address for our Globalization uh, Speaker Series be UT Zone uh, Professor Tony Hopkins. Now, Tony holds the Walter Prescott Webb Chair uh, in, of History and Ideas in the History Department uh, here on campus. He is a world-renowned expert on non-Western uh, history and on the history of Western imperialism. Uh, fortunately for us, his current work is looking at the history of globalization. Uh, he's recently edited uh, two different volumes, uh, one entitled Globalization in World History and the other Global History interactions between the universal uh, and the local. The title of Professor Hopkins' talk today is The History of Globalization and the Globalization of History. Our event here today is going to run to 1.30. I'll do one bit of housekeeping detail, which is if you have one of these devices or a cell phone or any other device that spontaneously starts beeping, playing the William Tell Overture or uh, one of Pink Floyd's greatest hits, I would ask that you either turn it off or put it on mute, vibrate, <coughs> get a little stimulation uh, during the course of the talk. But please, for the sake of our speaker, let's not have uh, his exciting talk be interrupted by uh, all the phones going off. Uh, with that housekeeping detail out of the way, please join me in welcoming uh, <coughs> Professor Tony Hopper. Well, thank you very much, Jim. It's a curious uh, observation about the talks I give over the years, that I'm always applauded when I start, but never when I finish. Uh, I haven't worked out the reason for this, but I suspect it's as a result of too much deference on the part of the audience. So I want you to try to overcome that in the next three hours that I have in my disposal. Uh, before we descend into that abyss, I must uh, reciprocate uh, and uh, express my appreciation to Jim Lindsay uh, for inviting me here. I know that is the necessary formality, but there's a little bit more to it that Jim has more or less explained to us. If this small series on history of globalization is a success, I shall of course claim the credit. <laughs> if it goes down the drain, uh, as may happen in an hour and a half's time, then of course the responsibility will lie elsewhere. But taking that entrepreneurial risk, it was Jim's initiative to reach out, as you say, to the history department to ask us to participate in this program. And if we make a success of it, who knows? We may be obliged to come up here and skirt the wire fencing yet again. <laughs> Now, when we were planning this, uh, Jim turned to the secret meeting I had with Mark Metzler and a couple of Jim's colleagues, and uh, he said, well, you know, we want a speaker who is dynamic, charismatic, well-informed. Uh, unfortunately, Fred Thompson wasn't available today, <laughs> and uh, so I am substituting, but I can tell you now I come an awful lot cheaper. 
And those of you who think there is something called a free lunch will be in for the surprise because you now have to listen to me. <laughs> what I'm going to do will displease most of you because it will uh, uh, take a course between the highest of possible generalizations and the lowest of possible empirical observations about this subject. And I'm doing that to train a vain attempt to try to appeal to something called, let's get it right, the highest common denominator and not the alternative. So you will, I hope, understand that I'm going to pass over all tricky problems of definition and so on, and I hope you'll take it for granted that I'm aware that these do need careful exploration, if, even if, in my own case, I'm not particularly capable of carrying out the exploration itself. This is, however, an opposite moment for historians uh, to be invited to be involved in this wider debate about globalization. It's opposite because this is a time when the discussion of globalization, as we all know, and Jim has referred to it again, plus the discussion of empire, these are both hot topics. Now, empire is, or at least ought to be, a historian's subject. Globalization at first sight isn't, except as we now know, it does have a history of some indistinct sort. So there is an opportunity there. Now you would imagine, if you're eager, ambitious, and trying to make your career late in life, as I am myself, that this would be a moment when you could actually command the universe. Uh, but uh, this is not the case, unfortunately. The public debate about these two issues uh, sees historians as scarce on the ground as members of the Democratic Party were after 9-11. They are not to be seen. With a handful of exceptions, empire is discussed primarily by non-historians, and with even fewer, if that's possible, exceptions, globalization is discussed, even in its historical dimension, by non-historians too. This is not a denigration. Such contributions are useful. I'm simply saying that historians who believe that they have an expertise in this field of some kind have an opportunity uh, to participate. If we ask the question and answer it quickly, why hasn't this happened, you will see immediately that there are a range of obvious and not so obvious explanations. The most obvious is, of course, the fact that historians are averse in the main uh, to studying what you might call ultra-contemporary -con history. And this is not just a fear of the modern, it is because their own expertise, their own source materials, their way of practicing their craft runs out at the point when most of the source materials are, forgive me, or much of it, much of it is ephemeral journalism, which is what one has to go on in many cases. <coughs> a more specific influence, and colleagues present will forgive me for mentioning this, uh, with the lightest of touches, of which I am uh, famous, of course, in my own estimation. And that is that the recent trend in historical studies known as postmodernism, for all its merits, I turn to my colleague here with a necessary qualification, because having seen him in the gym, he's much more powerful than I am, quite apart from being more brilliant. I wish that was false modesty, alas, it's true. Uh, because postmodernism shifted our attention away from structures, away from totalizing project, as it was called, away from generalizing and into intricate re-examinations of representations and images. For all its merits, the kind of exploration that is necessary in the study of the history of globalization was ruled out. It was unfashionable. So that was a second reason. On the other side, because one mustn't be too unfair to one's own tribe, on the other side, of course, we have the social sciences. I generalize, of course, with huge leaps, because one can always do this if you're speaking about a discipline of which you know very little. And that is that since the 1960s, the social sciences, by and large, have moved away voluntarily from history. No need to go into the details of why that happened. It is, I think, very observable. And if one takes International relations theory, for example, in its relatively recent guise of neorealism, you have an abstraction not only from the past, but from institutions, from agency and intentions. The result is to produce the most pars parsimonious and some would say beautiful explanation of a world that doesn't actually exist. <laughs> and then outside academia, there is a, an influence that has affected us both. I try here to pull this group together, having widened the gulf already. And that is the rise of think tanks from the 1980s. But again, with all their merits, they have cut away 
or closed off a channel of communication that was taken for granted in the 50s, 60s, 70s and into the 80s. And most of these think tanks are not staffed by historians. Some of their members write history, uh, Kagan is an example, uh, but these are not professional historians. So I think historians, I can't speak for the social sciences in this regard, how academic social sciences feel they relate to think tank social sciences, but the development of think tanks has interposed a set of institutions with the ear of government, or at least the ability to walk the corridors of power, which has further distanced historians, even those who want to have a shout, so to speak, in the public domain from doing so. Now, what I want to do is to talk about how the very slow development in the relationship between history and the social sciences has taken place through my observation over the past decade. And I shall be doing this by looking at some of my own work. And before you decide that this is yet another ego trip uh, dressed up as objective uh, scholarship, let me add that the story is a less than triumphant one, unfortunately. For some people, pride comes before a fall. In my case, it was the other way around, as I shall explain to you. Pondering in Cambridge the future of history, as one is obliged to do uh, in those dreaming spires and looking at all the uh, statues of the greats who've gone before, in the late 90s, I tried to find my way beyond the then current trend of postmodernism. It wasn't that I was a wholly hostile to this development, it was that I was, as many others, were beginning to be totally bored by it. If I had another student application wanting to study representations of the Bongo Bongo 1881, I would have shot myself. <laughs> uh, fortunately or unfortunately, that uh, didn't happen because I moved here. But, in the late 90s, I was trying to work out a way forward, and I produced an essay in the journal Past and Present, which, in 1999, which tried to work out a schema for presenting empires, the history of empires, as examples of the history of globalization. They were, after all, good topics, being transnational and multi-ethnic organizations, a ready-made subject to be reinvigorated and reinformed by the newer literature upon globalization, both in its economic forms and in its political forms. The big debate at that time was, was the nation state going to wither away in the late 20th century and so on. So some of these ideas I put into this remarkable article, an article of such brilliance that if I had more time, I could digress at greater length about it. Now, um, the idea of the article was not only to draw from the social sciences, but to contribute to them. Way. We historians are mere drawers of data and hewers of footnotes for the higher social sciences, and I was content with my role, but one way or another I reckoned I would score, either with historians or with the social scientists. <coughs> Past and present, as some of you may know, is regarded as being probably the foremost journal of history uh, in the world. The editors responded to my article with a necessary, inevitable enthusiasm. Wow! Let's fast track this, they said. It's bound to cause a huge controversy. Well, finally I made it. This is it. <laughs> Talent unsuspected has been realized. <laughs> the prospect of salary increases went to my head. I couldn't be a more prestigious post than the chair I held in Cambridge, but there are certain other deficiencies of working in the British system that I hope will be remedied by this. Fantasy flew ahead of reality, not for the last time in my career. <laughs> Well, the article was published. Unfortunately, the world did not come to a halt, something I'm still puzzling about. And more than that, it went down with a proverbial lead balloon. Not only did it create a massive controversy, which would have put me in pole position to be recognized, etc., etc., it didn't create any kind of controversy at all. Not even a note of approval, not even a note of something else. Nothing. Zilch. Now, there are two explanations. One we could reject immediately, namely that the article wasn't very good. Of course, I, <laughs> let's move on. The alternative, which I find particularly persuasive, was that I was not, for the first or last time, ahead of my colleagues in the field. What I said in 1999, they couldn't recognize. It didn't ring bells with them because they were still plodding way behind. With this, I comforted me, myself and my pride intact, and moved on. <coughs> 
I decided for the second venture to uh, surround myself with a little bit of insurance. Some of my distinguished colleagues at Cambridge, well, this could be a better vehicle here. We've got some you know, really big names here. So uh, that produced the book that was referred to earlier called Globalization in World History, a collection of essays arising out of the millennium lectures which we were all obliged to give, and uh, I pulled some of them together uh, after 2000. And I thought this time, a book for the first time, this is the first book written entirely by historians on the subject of globalization. Again, optimism allied to talent was sufficient to buoy my hopes. I thought then that we would really have make a mark. Now, this book, which I hold up here, and I might, if I can trust you all, pass round in the hope of getting it back, um, this book set out in what you would now think to be a fairly elementary form, uh, some of the basics of the subject. What do we mean by globalization? What are the potentials for economic, social, bloody cultural history? A broad church, not just the oscillation between one sub-discipline trumping another for 10 years before itself being ousted, but something for everybody. And then some of the pitfalls of going into this subject uh, blindfolded also were laid out. More positively, this book tried to do two things. The first was to challenge the World Bank's assumption that globalization began in 1982. I forget whether it was May or perhaps a late spring uh, later on. But anyway, it began in 1982. And this was something that historians would clearly wish to puzzle over and question. So what we tried to do, and I have to say that some non-historians, and I use that word not in a, a de a de in a deprecatory way, mm -hmm. some non-historians had already speculated about the long-term hi history of globalization, but we felt we needed to try and pin this down a bit more. So what we worked out was a rather mm, primitive schema of types of globalization that existed before the one we recognize today. We're careful enough not to call these stages of growth or ungrowth, we actually referred to them as categories or sequences which you could see overlapping and sometimes going underground, apparently liquidated, but then resurfacing again. So we tried to explore the history of globalization, but to do it in a reasonably coherent way, not just to say there's an awful lot of it, but how might we begin to sort it out. The second point the book made was to try to decenter the history of globalization. One of the points made in the introduction was that there is a danger of writing the history of globalization by using the term and a few other associated terms, but actually just telling another story of the rise of the West, the West and the fall of the rest. And that was a danger which cleverly, of course, the introducer uh, of this book, namely my good self, anticipated of which <laughs> has come to pass. Everyone is doing just that now. Very frustrating. And one wonders why it's worthwhile publishing anything sometimes. <laughs> But we did try to work out a decentered way of looking at the history of globalization to draw attention to multiple origins of globalization and to the interactions between those centers. And that is why, and here is exhibit number one, uh, the, I insisted on having a cover for the book which got as far away from the Western <coughs> image as it could be. This is actually my only copy yet here, so um, uh, I'll pass it round for those of you who need a distraction at this moment. <laughs> well, if I may return to this story with your, with your full attention again, because it comes back to me, that's why I don't have PowerPoint or maps. I don't want to lose anything from your concentration on this incipient tragedy of my career. <laughs> this time I thought I'd made it. After all, I got all these people around me. There was a book, not just an article. We've moved on a couple of years. But I have to say, and this is painful. I mean, The Saving Grace, let's put that first. The Saving Grace is the book is now widely cited. I wouldn't say more than that, but at least fair enough. It is quite at the time. We had some of those sniffy reviews that only the English can do. The equivalent of the raised eyebrow in words, you know. <laughs> this is the one that gets you what Oscar Wilde referred to as hitting below the intellect. <laughs> and so we have uh, 
I don't mention names here, of course, but we have Jeremy Black. <laughs> well, do we, do we really need this? And then Felipe Fernandez Armesto, uh, who recently was in the news, um, of course, I wasn't responsible for that unfortunate occasion that uh, brought him to the ground, um, but I did read about it several times. <laughs> he also wrote a review as well. Is it true? Is it new? What poetry? You get that? Is it new? Is it true? You know? So were these, these grandees of the subject giving these sniffy reviews, and one wasn't, again, sure of whether they were right or whether they were just bothered that they weren't included in the symposium. And that second thought should be struck from the record, please, because it's an excessively mean one, and a scholar of my stature should be struck with such thoughts. So I, I reject it immediately. But the fact is that even this book did not actually catch fire. Now we come to the time played out by the time we get to this book. We fast forward a bit uh, to my, my arrival here in 2002, and my seemingly overambitious attempt to corral some of my smarter, younger colleagues, my third and final effort to make an impression on this subject, uh, to produce uh, the book that came out a year ago, Global History, Interactions Between the Universal and the Local. This book, I have to say, is a considerable achievement, though not of my own, because it is, I think, the first time, certainly that this department, and perhaps any department of history has come up with a collective of this kind within one department, as opposed to writing textbooks and so on, which are all splendid, but of a different order. So there is a, a departmental element to this story, which we hope to have a kind of educational demonstration effect. If we can do it, so can others. And this is a way of moving this, showing that this subject can be moved forward in programs, courses, and so on. By the time we got to 2006, the mood had undoubtedly altered. The receptivity to work of this kind had begun to change. A sly interpretation of history, of which I am an experienced practitioner, would suggest that finally the world had caught up, first of all, with my article of 1999, which I may have mentioned to you, and it's brilliant that you have already ruminated on, but also then with the further book that's going round the table with my final there is justice, even in academic life. And I would be rewarded in all the ways that I indicated previously. Unfortunately, although I'm personally inclined to that interpretation, there were arguably somewhat larger forces at work, uh, including, of course, 9-11. So all those people who were not <coughs> interested at all before 9-11 suddenly got terribly agitated and what is, what's it all about? What are the roots of this? And so all these distant places that we don't learn about at school. And where are they? And so on. What are they doing? What are they doing to us? All of that came through. And it was that event which set in train, as you all know very well, the massive inquiries into global issues, long-run developments, and yes, what was called dismissively the totalizing project. Suddenly, we were all generalizers again, or if we weren't, at least it was legitimate to be a generalizer. And a new conformity was speedily and comfortably endorsed. And when I gave seminars at the end of last year to launch this book, the mood was entirely different. I can't say it was roses, roses all the way, but I can say that the audiences were, if not as large at this, at least as patient, and the book uh, and its endeavor, its undertaking, its project, as they used to say, uh, was given a good reception. One of the ironies that didn't pass me by was that I was invited up to Tufts University, uh, which now hosts the a global symposium, which encompasses all of the universities in the Boston area. So it's quite a big gathering. And who is the convener of that uh, um, occasion of that whole project but Felipe Fernandez Armesto, <laughs> who now runs the Global History Project uh, at Tufts. An irony that escaped him, but not, of course, me. <laughs> the results, I'm bound to say, have been so far more puff than performance. Historians are increasingly using the term globalization, but rarely with any knowledge of the now mountainous literature dealing with the subject. 
the gulf between historians and social scientists has yet to be crossed. Two small examples, Manfred Steger, whose globalization, a very short guide, he's a political scientist, has a brief section on history, but does not refer to any historical work, included by Herbert, which of course does condemn the book rather. And two historians to be balanced, as they say on the news, uh, in their failure to be balanced, Osterhammer and Pettersson have produced a book, again you may have heard of, Globalization, A Short History, which refers to some of the social science literature, but still cannot escape being, in my estimation, yet another history of the international order, and particularly the international economy. Now, our book here, which I will, again, pass around in the hope of getting it back, and that you will indeed, <coughs> as they say on the John Stewart show, I should be standing holding it for you so that um, you will go and buy it. Uh, it's, uh, it is uh, uh, worth <coughs> millions if one counts up the blood, sweat, and tears involved. But there we go. This book had three purposes. The first one was to relate the history, uh, the study of history, to the current debate on globalization, which has moved on since the 1990s. And, and broadly speaking, one of course can look at this trend from different dimensions. I'm only going to mention the one that impressed me as a way of justifying a new book in relation to the one I, I wrote, I, I, I and my colleagues compiled before. That in the 90s, the main theme of the globali of globalization, or one of the main themes of globalization studies, was the increasing sense of the homogeneity, the uniformity of globalization. We're all becoming the same, all wearing jeans, all listening to the same pop music, all have the same consumer taste, etc. etc. By the time you get to the turn of the century and up till now, other thoughts and other perspectives began to appear, particularly the idea that globalization could not only tolerate, but often reinforce and sometimes invent diversity. And that was the theme we latched on in our book. What is the relationship between universal processes, which could be ideas or movements of peoples or goods or whatever, and local, not just receptions, because the problem of the local, which I won't go into, is that it too is a matter of perspective from the position of a local that is a center or can be. So these terms are quite difficult, but I think in common sense language you understand what we were trying to deal with. So that's one thing we wanted to do. And uh, it, if Thomas Friedman was to produce yet another edition of his book, uh, Making the World Flat, he would today be advised perhaps to call it Making the World Bumpy Again. <laughs> Secondly, what emerged from our study was the extent to which globalization was jointly produced and not simply the result of the imposition or export of processes from one or more dominant centers. Indeed, in some cases, there was a process of recycling whereby an item or an idea left one place, arrived in another was rethought, turned around, exported to back to its origin, rethought, turned around, came back again, and went to other places. So in the end, if you ask the question, what is the center of origin, there is no sensible way of asking it, answering it, which indeed is a clue to the complexity and the antiquity of at least some of the processes we refer, refer to as being globalizing. I always take my gin neat, actually. <laughs> oh, that's bad. Um, right, so there was this educational function, there was the idea that globalization was jointly produced, and there was, uh, in the background of that, the notion that we would have to bring up, the, bring up to date the study of the subject uh, so that it would take account of this evolving sense of diversity and heterogeneity being produced by what previously had thought to be a uniform and homogeneous process. Now, time is running out and I really want to talk about myself again, but uh, I just want to pick, almost literally at random, one of the chapters of the book to give you a, a small illustration of the type of thing uh, that was done by my 
uh, remarkable colleagues, and I know I say this and you can't tell whether I'm being serious or not, but I'll put my serious face on. My colleagues <coughs> are extraordinarily smart and they are extraordinarily conscientious and they were really dedicated in following this, uh, seeing this project too. It was very demanding on all of us. Uh, and uh, the one I'm going to choose is simply, I've actually got another one here, and I know that Roger Hart is here. I'd love to talk about China and Japan, which of course I'm a world authority. But in his presence, I shall defer for the moment, and in the interests of time, because that's a fascinating uh, story there. But I'll talk about the, the contribution or aspect of it made by Carl Miller on the uh, phonograph industry. And I'm going to pick this one, I'm going to, just to give you a sense of what it's about because it could be read as economic history, but it's also social and cultural history as well. And that goes back to the extremely subtle point I made earlier, which I know you've remembered, namely, that the new history of globalization, if it's ever written, has an appeal across the board to the various sub-disciplines of history, and similarly ought to be able to connect to the various disciplines of the social sciences in the same way. Of course, it's treated predominantly as an economic phenomenon, we know that, but there are these other aspects. Now, a conventional approach to the history of a phonograph would treat it as an episode in economic history and in business history. In the early 20th century, the phonograph was invented in the United States. <clears throat> it can be linked neatly to the rise of large corporations, which, ding ding, are an anticipation of the globalized world of today. So that all adds up, game, set, and match, on to the next article, and why not? But there's more to it than that, and Carl Miller explained why. What really happens is that the phonograph was indeed this incredible uh, technological invention, but it was also considered to be, no pun intended, an instrument of what manufacturers and sales agents of the time, 1900s, 1910s, called cultural uplift. <coughs> Making classical music readily available would spread elite values and extend a bond of cultural union across the expanding nation state of the United States, while also being commercially profitable, gains all round. But the marketing strategy failed, at home and abroad. Instead, local sales agents discovered inadvertently, or had impressed upon them, the potential of catering for diverse ethnic cultures. At home in the US, Recent immigrants, surprisingly, did not want Gilbert and Sullivan. They actually wanted to have some of their own music brought to, to them in a form that they could both consume and preserve, which the phonograph offered to do. Agents in India, to take another of Carl's illustration, ran into the same problem. But they had to listen to the discordant sounds as they heard them in their ear, which, though on some grounds of ignorance and racism they dismissed as being inferior, and nevertheless had a potential which was brought to them to recognize the idea of recording local music abroad as well as among immigrants at home in the United States. And so what happened in this example is that the expansion of this transnational did all the things that economic and business historians said it did, but it did it for rather different reasons, and it did it with different results because in the terms of our book, it helped to codify and preserve the local rather than destroy it and make everything homogeneous. So one has echoes of this today in the concessions made, literally, in every sense, by McDonald's to, for example, the werewolf burger, which is made from local Transylvanian ingredients. The fact that instead of shoving the good US hamburger down the throats of the world, you know, McDonald's are making an adaptation. But as Carl and my colleagues have shown, of this type of interaction giving prominence to what is easily thought of as being an inferior local is at the center of the understanding of the history of globalization. Well, I'm going to conclude um, with uh, a happy return to my own work. Um, because I do have to rescue myself from what I have been obliged to admit to has been a less than triumphant progress so far. And I can't even do that, but I can tell you uh, what I'm doing now as an indication of one of the ways, only one, of the ways in which globalization and the literature that I've read is helping me to rethink uh, one of the very big problems 
of today, and that is the question of the how to categorize the United States as a world power today. Is it an empire? Is it a hegemon? If it isn't, is it something very different that we can't put a name to and track? Those debates which have occupied so many books and discussions, uh, that is a debate that I have picked up on. And i just tell you one aspect of what I'm doing with this which uh, underpins my basic judgments, namely that the United States is not an empire, and the comparison I'm making between Britain in the 19th century down to 1950 and the United States from then to the present day is one that emphasizes the uh, Dis the singularities rather than the similarities. Now, that is, is a judgment uh, that we won't, uh, you won't need to, I won't have to go into that you can ask me about it. One of these judgments has to be made on a matter of, matter of definition, of course, depends what you mean by an empire. So, you know, we'll have different views of that and I have my own set out elsewhere. But the other is something that I think is very important in the whole question of how we make historical comparisons. And as you will know, one of, the, one of the comparisons that is very familiar to us today uh, who look into this literature is the size of the American military. Oh, the United States is a superpower beyond, you know, the Romans, even the British, they couldn't match any of this, you see. Therefore, what are we going to call it? And the book's been written called Super Empire. It's not just an empire, it's a super empire because of this military. But you see, what that does is to take Rome or Greece or Britain or the Netherlands or Spain in the umth century, assess their military and put it alongside the United States today, abstracting <coughs> from the historical context. Now that may or may not be insignificant, the change, but it's certainly one that ought to be looked into. So what you're actually doing is making a false comparison. That comparison would only be valid if, the, if Britain was resuscitated brought forward in history and pitched in battle with the United States, in which you could clearly show that the United States was superior. The comparison, but I think that's unrealistic, even by Hollywood standards. No, <laughs> I'm not going to rule that out. In fact, I see myself in a starring role. <laughs> I must control this. Um, so the co correct comparison is actually to look at the effectiveness of the military part in its own time. And the fact that British could only manage two battleships or whatever it was is not a cause for, the, for them to be thought ludicrous in the 19th century. Those two battleships may have been streets ahead of everybody else at the time. It's the relativities that matter. Now, that's a, that's a point of principle <coughs> that I'm making. And on that basis, I am arguing that the change in the context between the 19th century and the second half of the 20th century is so significant as to indicate that we are indeed what we all thought before 9-11, uh, we are indeed in a post-colonial world. And the difference between the colonial world and the post-colonial world, the turning point is decolonization. And the reference back to my uh, unfortunate article of 1999, which I may have mentioned a few times, is uh, that the order, the globalization that occurred in the 19th century was one that was functional to the development of the nation state and indeed was an expression of it. The building of empires were a form of globalization. But we're no longer in that situation. The, the world <coughs> has changed. It changed, as everybody knows, after 1945. But it changed, in my argument, in ways, even I can't claim they're totally new, with a new emphasis to them, which extends our understanding of what is conventionally thought to be decolonization and adds to the significance of this wider sense of decolonization, which I will conclude by illustrating. Now, decolonization, as treated by historians, is really a fairly conventional story. You're dealing mainly with Asia, with Africa. You go through imperial policy. Was imperial policy, did they want to decolonize, or were they pushed into it? Oh, if they were pushed into it, look at the nationalists. And don't forget the international situation, which can be summarized in terms of the imperatives of Cold War. Basically, that is the story of decolonization. You make your career by emphasizing one of these rather than another. So, you see, I can run my colleagues down as well as they run me down, <laughs> especially if they're not present. <laughs> now, if one looks at the process of globalization and what we mean by globalization in terms of economic, ideological, and other social, migratory, population, demographic changes, a broader view of decolonization becomes possible. 
And what you have happening on the economic front after 1945, after a revitalization of the old colonial economies, was for the late 1950s the breakup of those economies. No longer, the first time in 150 years, the international order was not based on the hub-spoke system, going out to peripheries, exchanging manufacturers for raw materials. It had changed. What was happening for the first time on a significant scale was increased trade among the advanced economies. And that's why the so-called triad has emerged of Europe, North America, and uh, now the Far East. It used to be just Japan. I put China in with that. These are countries that, whatever their attributes or disadvantage, are not candidates for colonization. The rest of the world didn't sink out of sight, of course, but it became less significant on the economic front. So if one grasps fully the nature of this economic change in the middle of the 19th century, you can see that the conditions which led to the integration of the then advanced and underdeveloped worlds of the 19th century had changed altogether. Indeed, the problem for so many underdeveloped countries today is how to get in on the act not to worry about the consequences of adverse commercial relationships. Secondly, the resumption of international migration after the war, a key aspect of globalization, promoted, as we know today, but it was happening <coughs> then, multiculturalism, and it was this that ended the color bar. The significance of this for the history of empires of decolonization is that it obliges us to do something that has not been done before, to bring the old dominions, the white empire, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, back into the story. Because after the war, this part of the empire, there was an attempt to revitalize it, the British world. Let's send some more migrants out to strengthen this part of the empire. Let's subsidize them. But you couldn't send enough of them out to keep pace with the developing economies once post-war reconstruction had taken place from the 60s onwards. The demand for labor was such that the pro-white uh, racial segregationist measures had to be taken down to allow in migrants from all over the world to create a non-British world that you see emerging in Canada, Australia, New Zealand, etc., etc. today, a globalized world. So if we're going to rethink the transition between one stage of globalization and one that I date from around 45 or 50 down to the present, we've got to insert into it an understanding of the economic change, but also less well known, of this migratory movement and its political consequences for empire. And finally, again here a point that everyone knows, but is not so well uh, emphasized uh, in the literature on uh, decolonization. Concepts of human rights, which we used to think of, oh, it's all rather vague, tenuous, falls through the fingers, how could you measure that, the influence of human rights, etc. Well, more recent work has indicated that we need to give increasing weight and significance to the ideas of human rights, civil rights, <coughs> equality of human beings, which were re-promulgated, many of them were old Enlightenment ideas, but re-promulgated after 1945, and as we all know, via new institutions, which were preeminently global, like the United Nations and hosts of others. So if we do that, we see that what was happening after 1945 in the battle for hearts and minds across the world, and not only in the Cold War, but that's part of it, is the need by the dominant powers to make concessions to the aspirations of people who wanted to run their own affairs. And the people who wanted to run their own affairs were using this ideology against the dominant powers. You said you'd give us freedom and democracy and liberty and so on already. Well, okay, now pay up. Oh, well, we didn't mean it quite so quickly. Of course, we're on your side. It takes time. You know, the educators. They didn't buy that in the long. So the power of ideas is one that I think comes through from our greater awareness today of the role of communications in our internet world and so on and so on, which we more or less take for granted. And one implication of that is that I think the significance of this decolonization story not only has to go beyond the Asia and Africa to encompass the now neglected white empire, but it's got to include the United States too. Because there was a form of internal decolonization going on in the United States in the 1960s at exactly the same time 
as Ghana, etc., etc., were getting independence. And for the much the same reasons, I won't mention all of them, but obviously the question of ideas and civil rights was very, very important in shifting policy within the United States to form a type of long pending set of reforms which put the United States, the standard bearer of the free world, at least on an even par with uh, other countries in the world. Now, none of this applied to Britain in the 19th century. The British didn't have to battle with any of that, and they were able to make their way, as the French were as well, in a different environment. The context was entirely different. It favored the creation of empires, whether you like them or not. After 1945, empires were indeed history. And now the word that you've been longing for, uh, it is my conclusion. This isn't bad for me, because we didn't start till 12.15. In fact, I might take another <laughs> On the other hand. Uh, right, so my conclusion is as follows, that the history of globalization is only now starting to be written by historians for the reasons I mentioned at the outset. It does have great potential, again, as I mentioned, because it has an appeal across the board. You don't have to have a battle between economic historians who've virtually been liquidated, by the way, and cultural historians who are now a little concerned as to what their future is. This, this is um, a possibility for all kinds of history to be written. New topics such as pollution, disease, drugs can be put on the agenda. Old ones such as nation states and empires can be reinvigorated. There is also the prospect for the first time in many years of connecting the subject to other disciplines such as political science and international relations theory in particular because at least as far as international relations theory is concerned and I don't speak beyond that this discipline or sub-discipline has begun to move away from the ascetic rigors of neo-realism and to explore those things that previously were eliminated uh, from analysis, namely institutions, motives, and agency, which, of course, are very congenial themes for historians. So there's a possibility intellectually for a forging of interest that hasn't existed for half a century. Will history in turn be globalized? This is a more difficult question. The demand from the new generation of graduate students is certainly being felt. But the grip of the national epic whether it's the Nigerian national ethic, the British national ethic, or the legally required American national ethic, is such that combined with institutional inertia, which of course doesn't occur here, but in other places, uh, <laughs> makes it hard to turn programs of history from their present familiar course. Like the social sciences, history is also in the fashion business. The need to be at the cutting edge even with a blunt knife, the need to be up to date is already ensuring that the term globalization <laughs> proliferates in titles, and that's about often as far as it gets. Open the book that you've just bought, and there's nothing more infuriating to have done this. Open the book, and you've got another perfectly solid study of whatever it is. So historians are rapidly moving into this subject, but in a kind of deceptive way. And since so few other historians have actually read some of this vast literature, I've only read a little of it myself, you can get away with that. Well, it looks all right, globalization. Mm, yeah. You better <laughs> defer to that in case you know, we look old fashioned ourselves. So I think that we're at that stage at the moment. Uh, my guess is that current global issues, from global warming to the arms trade to communications, the revolution brought by the internet will have a considerable impact on research priorities. And that is why my pride has survived several falls. But fashions are fickle, and it's easy to be caught with a short skirt when hemlines go down, as I know from personal experience. <laughs> Thank you for a splendidly informative and splendidly entertaining talk. Uh, I think you've just shown that it is possible to be both engaging and to hit at the intellect, not below it. <laughs>
Uh, now, I believe you have graciously agreed to take some questions from the audience. Yes, that's included in the price, I think. Yes, I, I believe that it is part of, uh, part of our fee, so if you have questions, uh, please ask. And could I just ask, I'm, could I just make sure that, without rushing you, my books do come back? back to you? <laughs> you, will, you will make sure no one legal frisk before they leave the room. Good, good, good. Okay. Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, this was a wonderful, wonderful presentation, and, but it reminds me of a course when I was a young political science student in a discipline that was already considered obsolete in the early 60s, to hear Raymond Billington talk about globalization yes. and uses his model the frontier of the United yes. States, yes. which was very bumpy, yes. very much local versus manifest destiny, yes. and in which he said all movements within, and that become great movements, incorporate the seeds of their own destruction. Mm -hmm. uh, globalization may very well, as we see it today, incorporate those seeds mm -hmm. as we go along. Mm -hmm. uh, when And my, my thought is, when we pursue that concept, are we not seeing the seeds of the destruction of the, of the traditional nation state, the Pat San Paolo uh, example uh, of what has happened in the development of their new society mm. and in the Islamic world? Mm. It's a very different Islamic world than in the past. Mm. Do not these indicate that what we are perceiving as globalization, mm. as a smoothing out as a bumpy smoothing out is really not realistic in terms of its definition. Well, two comments on that. Uh, the first one is that I'm unhappy with uh, a formula that suggests that we have uh, a known or semi-known organic uh, metaphor to guide us that uh, societies and states are born uh, they rise through vigorous youth to maturity, they decline, and so on. I mean, hegemonic stability theory, uh, that most romantic of uh, disciplines or subdisciplines, uh, very much has that view in mind. And it's one that I think has a strange determinism about it for uh, the land of the free, frankly, uh, the, which initiated it. So uh, I am, as a historian, I would prefer to be somewhat open-ended about the future of states. And this is one reason why historians are poorly paid to understand the past, whereas some social scientists are highly paid to misunderstand the future. <laughs> uh, because we come up with these complexities which say, well, yes, you've got these sort of parameters and these possibilities, and it's no good. You've got to have a simple theory of a complex world, so the answer would have to be you can predict it from some way. Because the prediction's wrong, but people's need for certainty is a, is a reassurance is such that the false predictions can still elevate the predictor to a, situa a position of great eminence, where he can only, in the case of Francis Fukuyama, uh, repeat an error, make it double, make yourself doubly famous. Uh, that's all jealousy. The second point is that um, the debate about the role of the nation state, as I understand it, and I'm at the fringes of my knowledge here, has got a lot more complicated than it was in the 1990s. In the 1990s, there were some early books written which argued that the nation state's going to wither away, and you've got these great corporate entities which are aligning themselves across borders, and the nation state's going to be, become less and less significant. There's been a reaction against that view, and some people have argued, no, especially in the case of the United States, that actually the corporate elements and the state need each other, they're reinforcing, and the nation state will continue to uh, be uh, hugely influential and very vibrant in the 21st century. It's one of the reasons why when I wrote my piece in 1999, which I referred to, uh, I actually made a revision at the last moment to say that the nation state is being challenged, it's rather feeble, I know, challenged, whereas previously I'd rather gone along with the idea it's gonna wither away. Uh, so I think what I'm saying on that second point is that we've got to envisage but even a lot of variety of possibilities because it's a diverse world. Dr. Hawkins, thank you very much for bringing um, into our attention that there, there exists this disjuncture currently in the social science disciplines and history not working together. I argue that um, one needs a greater confidence in order to determine globalization in this world. Um, but that's just an opinion. But my question to you is the following. Um, given that one has both that backdrop, that the more disciplines need to work together in order to term, to term globalization and ultimately come to an understanding of what it means for everybody, um, if one adds to this a component that globalization now has also brought different people who have 
historically not been included in the narrative and not been able to express their views. How would you think that people from different parts of the world would participate in this process of framing globalization and what does it necessarily mean for societies who are currently exist on the fringes of the, of the world economy? Uh, I'm, I think, I'm not going to ask you to repeat that, I shall try to hope that I've got the essence of it and please correct me if I haven't so don't really dodge the question. The great thing about uh, being 157, my birthday is coming up by the way, and uh, all presents are gratefully, is that um, whereas for the first 156 years of my career, I have to answer every question. Now that I'm coming up 157, I can admit, not error, because that doesn't occur, but I can admit ignorance. Um, I think what I, what I gather from what you're saying is that globalization, we can speak almost in Leninist terms, is a very uneven process, so that you will have regions, if not all countries, which are caught up with it and fully involved, and you'll have other regions within countries, and sometimes in poor parts of the world of Africa, total countries, uh, which are left out of the process. And I think Castells refers to these as black holes, and Castells makes the point in his book on information and communications in globalization that uh, a large number of these black holes are in the United States itself. So whereas we don't think of the United States as a prime globalizer and all the rest of it, you know, that is true, but there's also an important qualification there of people who are not into the process. And of course we know on an international field Africa comes out as the prime example of a country that has more or less dropped off the bottom of the ladder. So that uneven process is there. Now you're going to have to ask the, the, the proper question arising from my understanding of that situation if I can take it further. Can you do that? Because I haven't answered your question properly, have I? I, I think I've described what it was that you were yes. the basis of your question, mm -hmm. but you wanted to know how these people can be pulled into the yeah, system. I mean, specifically, I mean, how can one ensure that in terming this, in terming globalization and defining what it will mean for everybody, how can we ensure that these people who have historically been not been included can be included in this process? Because obviously their understanding of both the history of globalization and now the globalization of their history is an understanding of their own culture and the way they see it, and not necessarily from the perspective of the people who have been in the past and telling their story for them. Mm, yes. Well, uh, certainly the revolution in area studies that has created the indigenous, the understanding of the indigenous history of the world in the last 50 years ought, in theory, to give us a much better understanding of the potential and consequences on institutions of opening up trade and other changes <coughs> that associated with global language. We have the knowledge. Of course, if we used it, it would have made a lot of difference in Iraq. We might even, not even have gone in there, but um, that's another story. When we, have, I, we have the knowledge now, but whether it becomes politically applicable is another matter. But a more significant point, I think, and this is where I have to really put wave a white flag, because as I said, being poorly paid, it's not my job to pontificate about what kinds of trade policies ought to be adopted, because your question really begs the issue properly as to whether globalization is a good or a bad thing, and there are different, different views of that. But if we assume uh, that, uh, let's say, that international trade on Smithian, Ricardian principles is, ought to be good, then what we should be doing is to think about the precise terms on which that principle can be applied to particular countries. And it is the particularities that are terribly important, so that uh, we, we would all then run through a checklist of things that to be done to uh, encourage international trade on terms which are favorable to the peoples who are, do not have the power. That is to say, we would wish to uh, reduce, we should have to reduce some of our own subsidies, our own quotas preventing cotton exports from, uh, from Africa getting to the United States because they're heavily subsidized here and so on and so on. So all of those things which are rather standard in the, the economic literature have to be brought into play. So at that point I'll put the white flag up on that and perhaps there's somebody else who knows much more about this can comment further at some point if you wish. Sure. Tony, if I may ask you a question. Sure. I am a practitioner in a profession in which uh, you are actually not unfairly observed uh, people are paid to misunderstand the future. And I'm also a professor here in the LBJ School, uh, where part of the challenge is to churn out students who can grapple with flesh <coughs> and blood policy problems. And that leaves me wondering, what is the proper role of history? And what is the best way 
part that, given that obviously they're not going to have time to go to the history pro and get a graduate degree there, you know, how do we how do we train students so they're sufficiently adept in understanding of history to help them in the chosen career? Mm. Well, I don't feel that my salary ought to be doubling by the minute with this range of... Uh, I'll, I'll take it up to Provost. Thank you. Good, applying questions, which, uh, again, uh, I've let myself in for this type of question, which is perfectly proper. Um, I mean, I don't, unfortunately, to disappoint you, I, I don't have, as Humphrey Littleton was once asked, uh, which, he's the famous jazz trumpeter, which way is jazz going? And he replied, man, if I knew which way jazz was going, I'd be there already. In other words, <laughs> if I had an answer to this, I think it would have been, it wouldn't have been my secret, it would have been applied already. But um, I think that your very willingness <coughs> to consider this does give a lead. I mean, why should it be impossible for students here, I know they have to do so many things, but if history of a certain kind is important, why should it be impossible for them, or let's, shall we say, not enthusiastically recommended for them to take a course of history? It doesn't have to be in the history department, but it could be a course, say, a highly paid course on the history of globalization, which um, I can suggest one or two people might have to teach this rather effectively. I mean, why couldn't we think of aligning a course that would suit your students, be approved by you, but which would be taught, if not by one member of our department, it doesn't matter, in such a way as to be based on historical sources and, and come at it in a way that historians would. Uh, we have lots of presents with them. Ibn Khaldun, of course, was the first to suggest that uh, history was necessary, for, a necessary art for wisdom in ruling. He was a politico himself, he didn't do very well, but that's another story. So, I mean, we have a long, a long line of people who have recommended this and regarded it as being an essential, not just background, an essential part of the thinking process of appraising the present, how we got from there to here. And what I think has happened in my truly biased way, out of ignorance, I wish it were otherwise, is that from the 60s, there was this revolution in the social sciences. In the case of the United States, it goes back, Dorothy Ross's book on the history of the social sciences in the United States is very telling on this, going back to the late 19th century. But picking up from there, in the 1960s, there was this revolution in which the social scientists decided to become scientific. Uh, you know, wear a white coat, have a, have a, a name on the desk, like this. <laughs> and, and, and to do that, they had to adopt what they thought were uh, science, natural scientific models of the social world. And they were aiming deliberately for a kind of parsimonious explanation. And to do that, of course, you have to throw out, as I said earlier, a whole lot of other things, which in the event uh, turn out to be extremely important in understanding the problem. If this wasn't the case, you would imagine that the history of the last 50 years would be a history of triumph, of analysis. Uh, of understanding the real world. I mean, we'd have all predicted the fall of the Berlin Wall, wouldn't we? Oh, no problem. <laughs> and we, in fact, well, what, we, what happened, I think, is that as I read the fiction, again, I'm being very unfair here because I don't want to be unfair. If it really worked, I would, I would snatch it for myself. But I think that so much of this work in international relations is better at predicting the past and the future. And if you look at the way in which the uh, priorities in international relations theory have changed the last 50 years. It's always after the event rather than before it. Reminds me of Tom Friedman's leaders in the op-eds in the New York Times, you know. He, he's now a critic of the war on all sorts of grounds and he was for it to begin with. We can all be wise the next day. And I, I think that despite the pretensions to science, scientific status, the record isn't one really to give a huge encouragement about predicting the future. And part of this, there are two reasons for it, I think. One is this desire, as I said, to get a simple theory of a complex world. And the other reason is that if we are to make our explanations bigger, we've got to make them more complex, the converse of that, make them more complex, and then it's more difficult to grasp and put across. And it doesn't, it, you then start losing the scientific status, which was the inspiration for the development of the subject. That's all extremely unfair.
But I, I think that there may be a point in there somewhere, even if I would have quickly to back off and water it down. But I, I would hope that it is possible uh, amidst the things that you do have to teach. There's always a demands on, on a limited number of amount of time for students, but it ought to be possible to put in a serious history course that would connect with what we're doing. I mean, some of the things I've been talking about, to be very serious, are not a million miles from the things that yeah. your students presumably would wish to know about, and, and that ought to be a very clear connection. The very minimum historian would say, well, that's how we would look at it. And no, you can't do it that way because, well, you can, but it would be, uh, in the face of the evidence rather than in the light of the evidence, because that's where we're coming from with our expertise. I told you my talks always end in total silence. <laughs> <laughs> Yet again. Well, Tony, let me say uh, a couple of things. Number one, uh, as somebody who is trained as a lab cook of political science, I'm reminded of what a student once said to me, any discipline that has to call itself a science isn't. <laughs> Unfortunately, I already had my PhD in political science, so it was, it was knowledge gained a bit too late. Uh, the second thing is, it is always a testament to a speaker uh, when he can fill the room. I think you have done that today, and have given us a very rousing and stimulating talk. It is a real delight. And here's the problem with being a success at something. It means we're going to call on you again to do something. <laughs> so uh, I wish everyone joined me in thanking Tony.